Hey everyone, it's Brad Chisholm here, and I'm super excited to be spending a bit of time with uh, my one of my real estate coaches and mentors over the last number of years, Mr. Ken Beaton. Ken has a tremendous amount of experience in real estate investing, specifically uh, creative deals and, and big deals. And so I'm very excited to, uh, to spend a little bit of time with Ken and pick his brain a little bit on uh, how he got started and, and why he likes real estate and big deals and, and a few other things and, and uh, just to share some thoughts. So thanks very much for spending some time with me this morning, Ken. My pleasure. And you, you forgot it one. Uh, you forgot one thing. You, you forgot to say, "Good friend" as well. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> good friend. Ken's such a nice guy. Uh, so, like I said, I, I'm <clears throat> very excited to to hang out with you a little bit here, Ken. Um, so, for the folks here that are watching, can you tell us a little bit about um, a little bit about your story, how you got started, and kind of where where the fun started for you? Yeah, where, well, it, it, uh, the fun started from a low place uh, in, in my life, actually. It's uh, back in, well, actually, I guess it started back in 1998 when I lost both my parents at that point in time. Uh, uh, my wife and I were uh, running a campground, and that was our primary source of income, uh, livelihood. And uh, uh, after the passing of my parents, I lost my passion for the, the campground. And uh, uh, we started to realize that, uh, yeah, we don't live forever. We need to start taking care of our future. And uh, we sought some advice, some financial advice, and uh, discovered that we were going to need a, a pot load of money uh, by the time we retire. And uh, we didn't even have a pot yet. So uh, we were starting from zero at this point in time in my life. And I was about 40 years old. So back in 2000 and not knowing what the heck we were going to do and I picked up a little book called Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki and uh, like so many other people who've read that book it, it did literally change my life because I realized that investing in real estate was the solution for us and uh, it wasn't a big stretch for us to shift into real estate investing because we were already dealing with people uh, from the tenant perspective with the campground and I had been a realtor back in the early 90s, not a very successful one, albeit, uh, but uh, it wasn't, uh, it, it was comfortable for me to move into that world of real estate investing. And uh, that's how we got started in it back in 2000. 2000. So it's been, it's been a few years. It's been a few years for sure. So <clears throat> how... What were you first getting involved in when, when you first made that decision that, okay, I'm going to get into real estate investing? What was it that you were looking at? And then how has that changed in the last 20 years? Initially, yeah, initially we didn't really have a uh, set plan or strategy other than we needed to acquire some rental properties to generate passive income. And the first property we purchased, um, hmm, trying to remember now that's so long ago the first property we purchased was through a company called 2020 investments where they do all the work they bring the deal to you and you are truly a passive investor you hand over the money and they they uh, uh they manage it and take care of it and that was a little condo in a complex in edmonton which to this day i've never seen it uh we owned it for about four or five years and uh uh, in hindsight, the joke is that uh, it cash flowed positive two dollars and forty cents or something mm -hmm. menial like that on a monthly basis. But at least it was positive, and uh, never cost us anything. And after three or four years, when we sold it, we made a, a, a nice little uh, income on it, uh, profit. So that was our first venture into it. Um, after that, we we started doing our own um, investing and. Uh, I came across a triplex that was for sale in a in the city of Kingston, about an hour and a half from where I live. It's where my daughter was going to be going off to college, and uh, just by chance, I drove down this side street, came across this property, uh, ended up purchasing it, and did very well with that triplex. And uh, as I say, sort of the rest is 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 history. But that was the beginning of it, and uh, um, we started off with a triplex, then moved to a sixplex just simply because the opportunity presented itself. I wasn't deliberately going looking for these uh, specific properties. I was just looking for real estate in general. And 
I shouldn't say I, I wasn't interested in single family homes at the time because Joanne actually uh, said, you know, why don't we buy a house in Kingston for our daughter to live in rather than living in residence? And I said, well, that's all good and fine, but we should buy something like a duplex triplex where there's more revenue coming in. Uh, so that's, that was the driving force for the triplex. And then the sixplex became available just around the corner. And then closer to home, an 11 unit building became available. And I just looked at the numbers, didn't really know and understand the difference between a single family, duplex, triplex, and an 11 unit building. Now there's a significant difference. I understand the difference, but I went into it um, uh, blind, <clears throat> not knowing any different. And uh, that was our first multi-unit building. And it was just by chance that we got into it. And when I discovered how easy it was, I, I just started buying multi-units instead. So is that something that, that, like, that you just knew intuitively that well, we should be going with, with bigger deals? Because I think, and, and maybe make it into this too, but a lot of people have, um, they're reluctant to get into or, or even look at larger buildings because they think, well, it's, it's, we're not able to do that. It, it's too big. It's, it's not something that we can think about. So when you were looking at these going from a, like you, you, when your wife Joanne said, well, we should just buy a single family house. You're like, well, no, maybe this, this triplex or a sixplex would be a better idea. Well, again, I'm a little bit of a, a different cat, I guess, in that um, I tend to think very logically, not emotionally when it comes to um, transactions. And if it doesn't make sense logically, you know, the numbers don't make sense, then I don't buy it. And when I looked at the numbers, a single family home just didn't make sense compared to a triplex. Mm. So from that perspective, it made sense. Uh, having a triplex and, and dealing with tenants didn't scare us either, because as I mentioned, coming from the campground, you know, we had over 100 sites. So I was already managing 100 tenants. It was just in a different right. format. So I was very comfortable yeah. working with tenants or potential tenants. So that wasn't uh, scary for us at all. And then the rest of it was just sheer ignorance because I didn't know what I should be scared about or, or, or whatnot, right? So and I just went ahead and did it. And the actual transaction itself was not scary for us because again, I had been a realtor, as I say, not a very successful realtor, but I had done some real estate transactions for others. So that wasn't foreign to me either. And it was just, it just felt right. When it came time for the 11 unit building, uh, we did the same process in analyzing the numbers and everything. Uh, it was definitely uh, a more scary experience for my wife, Joanne. Um, uh, she's a more reserved person. And uh, uh, this was a big deal for her. And it was something outside of our context, our, our, our normal world. Um, and it was in a community that wasn't thriving as well. And um, which... You know, you need to be careful where you invest. And in this particular case, the turning point for us was when we read an article in the local newspaper saying that Walmart was moving into this community and building a superstore. Well, Walmart doesn't move into a town that's going to die next year. So we realized, okay, they have done their due diligence. They feel comfortable investing there. We should be okay as well. And we've done very well with that building. And you still hold it now? Uh, no, I sold it uh, for the second time, actually, just this past weekend. Um, I, sold it, <laughs> I sold it three years ago to a fellow investor, a friend of mine. And uh, uh, I'm still a real estate agent now, a broker, actually. And um, we listed the property for sale, and I just sold it last weekend So to another investor. Wow. That's pretty cool. Uh, so that's a, that's a great segue. So what kind of things that's where you started. What kind of things are you involved in now? Now? Um, so well, I'll backtrack a little bit. I mean, I started off investing uh, in real estate from a place of ignorance, uh, I, would, I would say, and that um, I didn't know everything. Uh, well, I, I knew a fraction of what I know today. And that's mm -hmm. the old saying, you don't know what you don't know, right? And um, by chance, I was introduced to some real estate education courses, which were and still are very expensive. And at that point in time, my relationship with money is very, very different than it is today. And uh, in other words, I was cheap 
And, uh, um, but coming from a place where you don't have a lot of money, you tend to be frugal. And mm. it was very painful for us to invest in these expensive real estate courses. But I saw the value and I very quickly saw the value in these courses um, uh, as we progressed through the, the, the whole series of courses that they offer. It just kept opening my mind to more and more opportunities. And it also provided me the opportunity to discover my true passion, which was teaching and mentoring. And um, the, the people who were running these courses saw what I was doing on a personal level and investing. And they invited me to come and work with them and mentor mm. other students, uh, which was a, a huge opportunity for me and really helped me get out of my, my, uh, my, my shyness and uh, mm. um, excel at what I was doing. Plus, it allowed me to master what I learned because there's a saying that if you want to master something, teach it. Right. And uh, because you repeat it over and over and over again, right? Plus, it also forced me to walk the walk. Uh, yes, I was investing mm -hmm. in the apartment buildings. I was doing quite well there. But if I'm going to help other investors, <clears throat> excuse me, if I'm going to help other investors uh, with rent to owns or lease options or, or um, you know, anything of, of that nature, then I need to do it myself because I refuse to teach something I haven't done myself. So that opened up the opportunity for me to get into the rent to own business for a while. It allowed me the opportunity to understand uh, vendor take backs much better uh, and all these other creative strategies, et cetera. So I did that for a number of years, uh, really enjoyed that. Then I went off on my own, created my own education programs. I have since moved on with that. I was invited to move out to Edmonton. I'm from Eastern Ontario. I was invited to move out to Edmonton and open up a real estate brokerage with a friend of mine which I did, operated that for a few years where we focused specifically with real estate agents, uh, or sorry, real estate investors, um, working with agents with the real estate investing experience. So I, I, I matched the two of them together. Did that for a few years, came back to Ontario and continued on with our real estate investing. And then we decided that um, you know, it was time to start winding down and changing our focus, looking more towards retirement. I've since gotten out of the education business, um, and that was um, helped along its way with the, the, the recent COVID crisis that we're in, uh, which I, I don't regret. And uh, we, we then sold off all of our old, older, original investments in order to focus on brand new investments. So I've always had a goal of building an apartment building, but I've always struggled because the numbers never made sense. And while you can see in the picture behind me, that's the sketch of a building, um, I think the date's on it, 2009, that uh, that was my goal to build that 48 unit apartment building. But in my market, I could never make it work. The numbers just wouldn't work. Uh, the rents were too low, the cost of building was too high. Mm -hmm. And then the opportunity came along, you can see the four buildings above that one, yeah. Um, one of those became available and um, initially the numbers didn't make sense, but eventually they did make sense um, through a couple of different uh, changes in, in the real estate world. And um, uh, we, we put the first one under contract and uh, we had to really rush then and sell some of our properties in order to, to come up with the cash to buy it. And then uh, we put the other three under contract as well. And the other three uh, we also own. Uh, now we only own a percentage of those ones because I brought in investors to share the opportunity with them um, in that as well. So that's where we're at right now. Um, so with the exception of one small duplex, um, the only properties, rental properties we have are those four buildings. So uh, four 24 unit buildings. And uh, that's my, my retirement plan right there. No, I that's forget what cool. the question was, what I, I went on. And that's, that's what I tend to do. I tend to go off on tangents. So bring me, bring well, me no, back you, you, online here. You, you got there. You got there. The question was, what are you invested in now? And there we go. Yeah. So those four, four 24 unit buildings. So 96 doors plus yeah. a duplex. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I'm investing in is uh, people like yourself, because as a real estate broker, 
Um, I'm, um, I'm working with a, a brokerage that we have agents across the country to help other investors. And uh, uh, that's part of my retirement plan as well, is to build this group of real estate agents. And it's still all real, real estate related. And uh, I'll mm-hmm. do you know, two or three transactions a year. And, uh, but my primary focus is to help other agents like yourself and other members in our group to um, facilitate transactions and help new investors get started, new and existing investors. So uh, that's, uh, your, your segues are impeccable, Ken, because uh, that, that was going to be my <laughs> next question, <clears throat> is so new investors, um, I, I want to just give a couple of ideas for someone who wants to get into the market. Um, they know that real estate's a really good idea, but they, they don't own any property yet. They're not really sure what the next step could be or should be. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. So the biggest thing that I see um, holding people back from moving forward, you know, they, they might read a book and think that's a great idea, but the biggest thing that's holding them back, well, what they'll say is the biggest thing holding them back is going to be lack of money or opportunity. But mm-hmm. in reality, the biggest thing that's holding them back is lack of education and the right mindset. Right. Those two things are, are what's key to your success because the reality is in real estate, you can make money with no money. And a lot of people say, that, yeah, no, that, that's not true. Well, I've done it numerous times, time and time again. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is possible. You just need to learn how to do it. That's the education then the mindset in order to believe that you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. So those, those are the two major keys to help people move forward. And, uh, and I think to, to get started, they need to get educated. And um, there, there are some resources out there that they can um, get that are relatively inexpensive and some are free, but you have to be careful what you what you read, who you listen to, and, uh, uh, and what you believe. Uh, so it's always best to follow the lead of somebody who's already done it successfully. And uh, even if that does cost you some money, it is mm-hmm. well worth the money that you spend. I, I think that, like you said, there's, there's lots of information out there. And I, I would agree. Like the first step is getting an education and getting just getting to know um, the, the terms and, and some of the, the details about it and then find someone that you can connect with and that who connects with you. Um, Cause it's a lot of the similar information, a lot of similar information that's out there, but yeah, meeting with someone that, that you um, feel and this, <laughs> we're getting out there a little bit, but that you're in harmony yeah. with, right. That you resonate yep. with that, that, um, that you can connect with and, and that, that their message makes sense to you because it, so the same information from one person is may not have the same impact as the same information from somebody else so look for the information and look for someone in in a way that is going to connect with you and, and help yeah. you with that exactly yeah. well and that's a um a perfect point of that is robert kiyosaki i mean uh, uh he's an amazing individual you either like him or you hate him uh, he's got that type of personality. Um, not everybody likes him and that's okay. Not everybody likes me or you and that's okay as well. Um, mm-hmm. But the reality is, I mean, he changed my life when I read his books because what he writes about and talks about just simply makes sense. And he's not a great yeah. teacher in the sense that he doesn't teach a lot of stuff. He introduces you to new ideas and new concepts. You have to get the education beyond that. Now, I did work with Robert and his education company because he did have, he actually took over the educa- real estate educa- education company that I was working for at one point in time. Mm-hmm. So he did have for a while an education division that would teach people what he was talking about in his books. But if you read his books, you're not going to get educated. You're going to get inspired. Mm-hmm. And um, the inspiration will cause you then to, to look for the information that will teach you. Um, and this is where I will plug my book. You can hold that book up if you want. And sure people can. can reach out to you and get a copy of that book if you want. 
Um, but I mean, this book was written for the purpose of teaching people how to invest and, um, and then property management as well. Yep. So, I mean, if people want a copy of that book, they can reach out to you and get a copy of that book. Um, yep. And then we'll teach you what you need to know. But there's much more to learn than what's just in that book as well. And yeah, for, sure. for some people, they can read a book and not get anything out of it. Other people need to be um, more hands-on and, and in a classroom. So, yeah, get the education. Fantastic. So the getting educated is, is a great place to start. So someone who has, say they've got two or three or four properties now that they're, they're self-managing and they, they want to grow and expand, but they're, they're either out of money or the banks aren't going to loan them anymore because of uh, their lending rules. What kind of suggestions do you have for someone yeah. like that? So again, the reason they're stuck is because of their mindset the belief that they can't go any further, the belief that there are no other options. And the reality is there are other options. They just need to, again, learn what those other options are. And that means finding out, you know, um, I, either through courses, reading books, whatever, you know, through other mentors, how they grew their portfolio. So quite simply, um, what's holding people back uh, when they reach that three or four houses, single family homes, duplexes, is the banks stop lending to them because they uh, perceive them to be risky. And the banks are perceiving them to be risky because they're perceiving them to be uneducated investors. And therefore they put these roadblocks up and say, no more for you. So you shift gears and go into the commercial world. And as soon as I say commercial world, most people just say, oh, that's too expensive. That's too difficult. There's, you know, they come up with all of these perceived roadblocks that other people have presented to them about commercial investing. And what people don't realize is that an 11 unit apartment building is a commercial property. A strip mall is also a commercial right. property, but two very separate commercial properties. So I'm just talking about commercial residential. And it's actually easier to qualify for a commercial residential property than it is to buy a single family house. Case in point, when I moved back from out west and uh, uh, we wanted to buy a new house when we moved home, well, mm -hmm. both Dry and I are entrepreneurs. We don't have T4 slips that we can hand in to the banks to prove uh, that we've got money for the, the house. So we had to pay an extremely high interest rate at that time. And we, only, we had to put 35% uh, down on the mortgage as well in order to buy our house. Yet on your at the personal same residence? Time, on our personal residence. At the exact same wow. time that we were doing that, we were also buying uh, two apartment buildings worth $4.7 million. No issues. Because they don't look at me. They look at the apartment building. Right. And so that's, that's part of the next question then too, is so what is it that, um, that you like about big deals? And I know that the qualification process is, is one of them. Um, so maybe we can touch on that a little bit more, but what else is it about those bigger deals once you get into the commercial residential, so multifamily investing, what is it, what is it that draws you to that world? Um, the ease of, of financing them. I mean, it's not to say that it's, easy it's easier and it's achievable um, so the fact that it's achievable is what's really appealing uh, because as I pointed out I mean uh, I could go I could go a year and have thirty thousand dollars a year recorded income mm -hmm. and the next year I could have one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and the next year twenty thousand dollars and that that's for tax purposes and you know you want to keep your money sheltered here and there whatever the case right but that doesn't do you any good for qualifying for a mortgage. Um, right. Yet, when you look at an apartment building, and I'm talking eight units or bigger, then the banks are going to look at the building itself to see whether the building can qualify for the mortgage and financially support it. Uh, if the building can qualify for it, then they look at me to see my credit worthiness, not how much income I'm making, but just that I pay my bills and I've got good credit. And uh, then it's a done deal from that perspective. Uh, the other thing I like about big deals is the lower risk. 
when I've got a 10-unit building and I've got one vacancy, okay, that's a 10% vacancy unit in that particular property. If I've right. got a single family house that I'm <laughs> renting and it's vacant for two months, that's 100% vacant. There's no income coming in, but I still got the same expenses. So right. it just, it's to me, illogical to buy single family homes as investment properties when you can buy a multi-unit building. Um, and I don't mean to be slamming anybody that's buying single family homes. It's a great way to get started. Absolutely. And there's money to be made there. You just need to know and understand the risks associated with it. Plus, when you've got, when the furnace goes, the tenant's not going to replace the furnace. You, as the owner, have to replace that furnace. And uh, you can't increase the rents or anything of that nature. But with your single family, with your multi-unit building, you've got 10, u- 10 units to cover the cost of that furnace versus just one unit. Yeah. Plus, so this is, I'm, I'm thinking forward here. If you've got the same number of doors, so say you've got a 10 unit apartment building or you've got 10 single family houses, you now have 10 furnaces to think about and 10 roofs to think about and exactly. all the other expenses, 10 lawns to mow and all that stuff that goes, that goes with it as well. Um, versus with one 10 unit building, you've got one furnace or boiler, probably yep. one roof, uh, just your expenses are more consolidated in one exactly. area. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so I think you, you touched on this a little bit too, but so with those bigger deals, um, sometimes, and, and I know you've got some experience with this, but sometimes it's not always a very straightforward deal. Uh, by straightforward, I just mean like, you know, you put your 20% down, you get an 80% mortgage from a bank and Bob's your uncle and away you go, you own the building. Because I, I, I know you love doing creative financing. I know you've, you've done lots of it. What is it that you like about creative financing? Can you give us just, I, I know it's a big topic. Can you give us a couple of examples of what creative financing is and how it works for uh, for a seller out to, to benefit them as well as a buyer? And, yep. and what does that look like? Well, again, there's a time and place for creative financing. Um, it, it does, it's not going to work in every opportunity that uh, is presented to you. For example, with these new buildings behind me, there's not much creative financing there. Um, you know, you, it, especially in a seller's market. I mean, they don't, the seller's not motivated to be creative or to help mm-hmm. you achieve your goal of, of ownership. Um, but in a buyer's, uh, when it's more of a, a buyer's market and um, the seller's having a challenge selling the property, they're more motivated to work with the buyer. Um, so, uh, it, you can, again, people are, are so programmed to believe that, um, to buy a building, they have to go to the bank. Well, that's not the first place I go to. Uh, the first place I go to is private money. And again, it depends on the opportunity that's being presented. Um, to get started in real estate, if you want to get, uh, Um, your hands dirty and roll your sleeves up. That's where you're going to make your money is when you're more hands-on and you're dealing with older properties that need some repairs. Mm -hmm. And if you go in there and do it through the conventional financing process, you're going to um, struggle because you're not going to be able to, to pull the equity out as quickly or as easily as possible as you turn that property over. You're not going to access as much equity in it initially. Uh, So a quick example would be, if you're buying an underperforming property and you've got access to private money, whether it be your own line of credit, whether it be your own cash, whether it be a friend's cash or whether it be RSP money, there's all kinds of sources of private money out there. And at today's rates, uh, interest rate, conventional mortgage might be going around two and a half percent, three percent, you know, in that range. Mm-hmm. So if you throw out the number like eight, nine, ten percent interest, people just, oh, no, we can't do that. Well, again, that's the mindset kicking in right. and stopping you from moving forward. Uh, I bought one property with a 12% private loan short term, like up to a year. And yeah, it cost me a lot of money interest, but it allowed me to buy the property privately with borrowed private money, as mm-hmm. well as a combined VTB then. And the VTB was for the balance of the property, uh, the balance of the money, you know, so I was into the property with no cash. You know, uh, uh, the private lender gave me 
about 60%. The seller gave me mm -hmm. 40% VTB. Okay. Uh, I closed on the property. I then had cash left over to do the renovations. Six months later, a year later, whatever the number is, you've now improved the quality of the building. You've improved the rents. You've improved the value. Maybe it's 50% more valuable now. Then you go to a bank and say, I would like to refinance the property that I own. Mm -hmm. And the bank will look at it and say, okay, yeah, here you go. And they're going to finance it at the higher value now. And you're going to have enough money to pay off the, uh, uh, the, the VTB as well as the private money. And now you own it still with virtually no money into it. So there's all kinds of strategies <clears throat> like that, that um, they work. I've done it. I continue to do it. And I, and I, I've got students who are doing it as well. It's just a matter of a knowing that you can do it, believing you can do it and understanding the steps to do it properly. And that's part of that uh, education piece, right? And Absolutely, people that yeah. are, that are doing it and that have, that are yeah, know what, that, the reality that, that is know what they're doing. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. Right. Uh, so you, and I don't, I, I, there's a ton more I need to learn and I'm willing to, and open to, to learning. But if you think sure. uh, you've got all the answers right now and you're stuck, then you're going to remain stuck. Mm. Um, okay, cool. So you, you, you talked about uh, a VTB, which is vendor take back financing. Um, can you just, again, just briefly touch on what that is if, in case someone who's watching isn't sure what a VTB is? Yeah. So it's when the seller virtually becomes the bank. If uh, the seller is selling a property and they own it outright, they don't have any debt service, then they don't need the cash from the sale to pay off the, uh, an existing mortgage on the property. Therefore, they could actually be willing to create a mortgage registered against that property for anywhere from zero to 100% of the value. And it's mm -hmm. up to them as to what they want to uh, what percentage they want to lend to you. Uh, typically, they're going to want you to have some skin in the game as well. So they might go up to 80, 90% loan to value, or they might say, I want top dollar for this. I want more than it's actually worth. So if the bank's going to give you 60% of the, the purchase price, I'll give you 20% of the purchase price in a vendor take back in the form of a second mortgage against the property. Now you only have to come up with the balance of the cash for it. So there's many different combinations to create uh, a vendor take back. I have had 100% vendor take back mortgage on a property and uh, it was a short term. It was only nine months, but it allowed me to get in there, do the work, renovate it and make it worth more than what I had agreed to buy it for so that I could get uh, conventional financing for it. And, and go in and get, get it financed for that higher amount. For the higher Pay amount, VTB. exactly. And probably yeah. put some money in your own pocket as well. Yeah, exactly. And even then there's, you know, lessons learned over the years. There's different ways of structuring that deal from the very beginning in order to ensure that you're going to be able to qualify for the highest value possible in the future when you go to the bank. Mm. So again, it's to know the rules that the banks use and uh, all the other lenders are using and then um, apply them and work them in your favor. So I think we're, we're, that'll probably be for the next the next interview. It looks like there's lots more information here that we need to, oh, yeah. <laughs> to, to get into because <laughs> I know we're getting squeezed for time a little bit here. Um, so I, I just want to say thanks very much, Ken, for for spending a bit of time and and just touching briefly on on some of the advantages of of mindset and educating um, bigger deals, creative financing. Um, and, and teaching and, and I, I know you have a passion for that and, and you're so good at it um, and I'm, I'm very thankful and and honored that I get to spend uh, this kind of time with you. Um, is there anything that you want to say kind of to, to close things off for, for everybody that's uh, well, listening here? It's been my pleasure. I love talking about real estate. I love helping people achieve their goals and uh, um, I love I love helping you get to your goals and helping your clients and whatnot. It's uh, the uh, there's a general rule that I learned many, many years ago. And uh, uh, if you want to become wealthy, the more people you help, the richer you become. So uh, I have no idea if, when, or how this will ever pay off financially to me. And I don't care. I just know it will. Um, 
because that's what life's all about. And uh, anybody who's watching this, <clears throat> know that you're dealing with the top notch guy. You know, um, Brad is, you're, you're an awesome person and uh, you're doing extremely well. I'm very proud of what you're doing in the real estate world and uh, anything I can do to help you um, and your clients moving forward, happy to do it and look forward to chatting more about this sometime. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Ken. My pleasure.